Hi everyone, it's author MJ Gallagher here and welcome to a new podcast series where I'll be talking about the development and behind the scenes content from my new book, Greek Myths That Inspired Final Fantasy VII. The book was successfully funded through a recent Kickstarter campaign with the podcast being one of the stretch goals, so thank you so much to everyone who backed the project. I'm joined today by my good friend, fellow mythology enthusiast and Final Fantasy VII community guru, Schrodinger's Baby Seal. Hello there. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I I really appreciate uh, being asked to join. Um, so for, for anyone who's listening that's not actually familiar uh, with, with who I am, um, I, again, I'm MJ Gallagher, an, an author uh, from Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, I've been writing about Final Fantasy VII in one form or another for almost 20 years. Uh, mainly it was fan fiction up until a couple of years ago. Um, I've taken a great interest in global mythology uh, and I released a book in October 2020 uh, called Norse Myths that inspired Final Fantasy VII. Uh, And that's really where things have taken an interesting turn uh, in recent years. Uh, And uh, for Baby Seal, uh, could you just introduce yourself uh, and uh, as well as your background in mythology as well? Absolutely. So uh, like like has been said, my name is Schrodinger's Baby Seal, which is uh, uh, probably less clever than I think uh, quantum physics joke. I have a background in, in... mythology philosophy uh from a um i have both taught and uh deeply studied uh primarily uh arabic lore and its relationship with uh n- known and current religion so uh comparative philosophies comparative religion com- comparative mythology has been my focus uh so i have a uh perhaps a, a little bit more focused uh uh, you know, set of of knowledge on Judaica, so Kabbalah and uh, Gnosticism uh, were were my you know primary uh, primary focuses in academia. So, uh, and then also I just happen to be a a massive uh, Final Fantasy VII fan, and uh, I regularly stream on Twitch, uh, where I will do lore lore breakdowns of. Um, various media associated with the compilation of seven and um i host a uh, a weekly talk show where we uh break down the the lore of final fantasy seven called seal team seven of which uh our illustrious mj gallagher has been the guest of many many times uh the uh general consensus uh that i have on uh mj gallagher though is that uh he's the master of of mythology and I'm the master of religion. So that's that's what I'll say on that. Well, that's that's actually a very good way of putting it and thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um I guess uh when you and I first met, um it was it was through a discussion, or actually as it turned out a couple of discussions. Um one with mm-hmm. um Night Sky mm-hmm. Prince and John Bentley and then later with, with uh me yourself and Sleep Easy, uh, just about mm-hmm. mythology and religion in um, Final Fantasy Seven, and that was that was sort of where our, our friendship really kicked off. Um, in terms of like this, this was after I'd released Norse Myths that inspired Final Fantasy Seven, and um, what you know, what what was it the the sort of obviously we 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 are of like mind in terms of mm-hmm. where our interests lie, but um. You know, what what was your first impressions after you'd you'd sort of come across the book and how how did you come across the book? So I I, I came across the book through Twitter and I I saw that I just saw the word Norse myths and then I saw a picture of, of the Fenrir logo and uh I immediately I immediately messaged my friend Sleep Easy, uh who is known for his deep dives in lore and final fantasy seven. And, uh, and I said, Hey, have you heard of this guy? And he's like, Oh yeah, I, I, I keep, I kept meaning to point that guy to you. And, um, and so I, you know, I looked and I saw that, uh, you know, you had a book coming out. It hadn't released mm-hmm. yet well, actually okay. when I right. first saw you. 
when I first saw you. Um, when we first talked, you know, it had, it had released and you had let me, uh, let me read it. And yeah. I had provided copies to everybody else in the, <laughs> in the, uh, in the discussion because I was so excited yeah. about it. But, uh, I, I was, I was really, I was ecstatic, um, that, you know, a book could be written on it. I'd always seen, uh, mythology featured heavily in final fantasy and more so in seven than I'd seen, uh, seen in the previous, uh, works. Yeah. And, uh, that might not be fair to the previous works, but it's just the first place that I noticed it. Uh, and, and I, of course was, uh, more centered around, uh, you know, the religious, the Gnostic and Kabbalistic, mm -hmm. uh, references that were, uh, you know, associated with its villains and its antagonists. I was, was more focused on that, but I was always aware that there was this other component. And um, I I knew that there was a, a deep well of information that connected those two things, that connected Norse mythology with Final Fantasy VII, but I never imagined that it was as deep as the connections you found in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was I was among the first to get my full hands on the or my hands on the full copy of that of of Norse North Smith's that inspired Final Fantasy VII. I got extra books. Yeah. I show them off on stream. So you know it it was just exciting to find somebody that really saw uh, Final Fantasy VII as a way to explore those topics. Uh, you know in 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 the detail that you. Uh, unlike anybody else has well, i appreciate that and, and thank you as always um for your support um you, you mentioned there that you know the um, you didn't feel as if the earlier final fantasy games um were as heavy mythology wise and i would i would agree with that i would um i'm not as familiar with them as i am with seven um but you know, through my own research, um, mm -hmm. I think the big difference, and you know, certainly what's leapt out for me in, in something I talk about in the book is that um, I think Kazushige Nojima has a large part to play in that because up until seven, a lot of the mythology that had appeared was based on Dungeons and Dragons mythology right. rather than global Absolutely. mythology. So, um, right. while while there are plenty of connections to be made. It, you know, the, there's the Dungeons and Dragons is this sort of middleman, which, you know, like uh, Tolkien's Middle Earth, you know, th there are inaccuracies uh, in terms of what you're basing your lore from. Um, right. So I, you know, I, I will forever be asking my que or myself this question of, you know, do I love mythology uh, as a result of Final Fantasy VII, or is it just a coincidence that I happen to pick two topics that are so heavily entwined? Um, but you know, the one of the things that for me when I started looking at it, the the Norse mythology is, uh, you know, it, it plays such a fundamental role in in the the story of Final Fantasy VII and and how things come together. But the more I research, the more you know, it becomes apparent that, you know, through comparative mythology, looking at, you know, Greek mythology or looking at other uh, Indo-Roman, uh, sorry, Indo-European mythologies, you know, mm -hmm. you can tell that because there are crossovers within, you know, Norse mythology and Greek mythology and whatever, that there are always going to be some of those crossovers um, that inspire the game. So the more I looked at Norse mythology, the more I realised that, you know, oh my God, there's there's a, a huge amount of Greek in here as well. Um, so when we first actually had a, a lengthy conversation, you know, it was because you're looking at this from the the, the religious element uh, with the, the sort of Judeo-Christian side of things. You know, that that's not something that I'm uh, massively familiar with. So I I sort of revert to sure. your expertise on that. Um, but I can I can clearly see. The, there are very very specific types of mythology that keep that keep coming back and keep coming back and um when when you and I had that that discussion um last year for the first time it was like you know to to have someone else that understands how I look at the game or how I look at media in general um it was it was so thrilling because I thought I was the only one that actually cared about this stuff you know. Well, 
you weren't, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's when we say comparative mythology, uh, you know, I, 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 I like to be careful because I do, I respect that, uh, people do practice current religions yeah. that a lot of these concepts come from. Um, but to be clear, a lot of the through lines that comparative mythology has with the uh, Arabic mythology is Islamic folklore mm -hmm. um, bleeds so uh, pristinely into uh, Judeo-Christian norms, mm -hmm. beliefs, and um, quote-unquote myths that, uh, you know, there isn't necessarily a distinction between um between religion and myth within the the realm of of final fantasy 7 mm -hmm. and uh, i've always found that like this this one of one of the most beautiful things about meeting you was that um i see all these themes kind of imprinted through um say you know like we we talk about trees of life mm -hmm. as a as an example um you know that's a uh, that's a heavily referenced concept in Final Fantasy VII, and you talk about it, uh, uh, you know, a little bit with with the representation of Yggdrasil mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the Nine Realms, and you know, I would talk about it in reference to um, you know the emanations of Ein Sof, which are uh, the Sephiroth, mm -hmm. you know, where we get our our antagonist, and uh, you know, those themes as a as a reflection, I I'm really I've probably thought more heavily about the connections between uh, our myths, our faith, um, as a result of Final Fantasy VII than any other single piece mm -hmm. of media. Yeah, well, that's. I think that's one one of the the beauties of it is that it's. Um, I certainly I I found that I could uh, understand the myths better by put them into sort of relative terms, you know, un understanding the myths through Final Fantasy VII or, you know, understanding the myths through um, things like, you know, Game of Thrones or, or Tolkien's works, mm -hmm. so, you know, when when you, because the, the stories themselves were written for a different, you know, a different time, different cultures, so the context of them is quite often lost. So if you can apply right. them to what you're familiar with, and there's very often uh, ways to, to sort of better understand what the, the myths were. Um, I, I've certainly found that. Um, and, you know, it's it certainly kind of going down, going down this route and in, in, in spending the time learning about the comparisons between uh, Norse mythology and Final Fantasy VII really uh, sort of... Um, uh, it made me feel empowered. That it gave me inspiration to to look deeper uh, into sort of the, the the wider Final Fantasy universe um, or, or different types of mythologies. So, um, prior to or uh, prior to the actual release of the book, I had spent a bit of time looking at different mythologies across the different Final Fantasy mm -hmm. uh, games, and you know, writing little blog articles and using them to. You know, sort of point me in the, the direction that I might want to go after Norse myths that inspired Final Fantasy VII. And, you know, the, the first time that we spoke, there was the, you know, well, we, we'd obviously both come to the same conclusion that there's a, a wealth of information that is, is just ready to be tapped into. And the, the biggest surprise that came for me is, you know, the, the success of the book because. You know, it's, it is without doubt an extremely niche subject matter. Um, sure. So to actually have that level of response was was enormous for me. You know, to to be able to say, okay, well, we can now look at other things. So you know, I, I considered whether or not I was just going to do like a mythology that was behind the summons, or you know, would I take the everything I'd learned about Norse mythology and look at Final Fantasy VIII, or would I take you know, stick with what what I was most comfortable with in Final Fantasy VII, and actually focus on a different type of mythology. Uh, and, and Greek mythology just was was the obvious one. Um, that well, so specifically, what was the most obvious 
Greek connection that you had just been itching to to explore before we get into to you know uh you know the journey to all of Greek what was the one that stood out because i have i have a one that stands up for say norse mythology mm-hmm. and that that's uh you know midgard sormer mm-hmm. uh was the, you know the zolom was the big one and then all of a sudden the you know the numerology of everything started to uh click together and then uh and then so on the on the norse mythology side i had that click yeah. for me uh real, real early on the and and then on the uh you know the Ar- arabic side or the you know uh, judaica and gnosticism and 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 the it was so in my face mm-hmm. that it was kind of hard to like ignore uh the sephirot genova trees of life uh a lot of iconography mm-hmm. every everything on that side of the you know that side of the calamity being uh you know being named within this confines mm-hmm. of of biblical and uh i i it, it seemed as though there was a you know a power struggle between this genova or or you know jehovah yeah. which you know is ein Sof and sephiroth like that stuff was real real clear and obvious the the Norse stuff, like the that that was under just a single layer of subterfuge. That when I peeled off, I was like, "Wow, there's a wealth here." Yeah. And what I'm I'm really fascinated to know is what was the thing that you peeled off in Greek mythology um, that let you say, "Huh." I think I think the I can recall going back uh, a number of years and being fascinated by. Gaia's Cliff, and specifically the Gaia's na- Cliff, specifically the name of of Gaia, because it was, um, it kind of jumped out in me. Like the the name, it, it was one of these things that you know, just like almost on an ins- instinctual level, it, it sort of it resonated with me. Um, and it was it was kind of later picking up Final Fantasy Nine, and the the name reappeared, but with a different spelling, because the the Gaia in Final Fantasy Seven is with an E. Uh, whereas Gaia in Final Fantasy IX is with an I. Um, and it was only when I sort of thought, well, that's that's a bit odd. What's that all about? And looked into it and realised that it's, it's the, the sort of uh, the original Greek and Romanized versions of the same name. Um, that it, the, the whole thing began to dawn on me, right? Okay, well, Gaia's Cliff is actually, you know, it's, it's named after the, 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 the world that this is in. And started to look at, okay, well, Guy in Greek mythology is, is Mother Earth, and the story, the the, 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 the foundations of the, the sort of Greek myth cycle, or the main Greek myth cycle, is, is how uh, Gaia gave birth to the Titans and gave birth to some of like, the Hecatonchiers and the, the Cyclopes and things like that, and when, you, when I looked at this, it started to dawn on me, like, okay, in Final Fantasy VII, Gaia's Cliff is a massively important location just because it is the northern the, the northern crater, it's where Genova landed, it's where Sephiroth goes to refuse his body, it's where Cloud, you know, comes to term or comes to terms with um the that things are not right and, and sort of has his mental breakdown and hands over the black materia. So the actual location itself is such an uh such an important part of the story. So why mm-hmm. why specifically would they name it Guy's Cliff? I mean, you look at the lore and the, the, the meteorite, you know, striking the planet and the meteorite representing sky and the calamity that came from the sky and all, all sorts of like, wait, hold on a minute. <laughs> Greek mythology is there really quite go. specific about, you know, Mother Earth and Father Sky and how they are forced union. Um, sort of, this is where... The, the sort of global conflict first came from. So I think it was it was at that point that I was starting to think, right, okay, there's there's far more to this that it meets the eye and you know it, it might not be a particularly you know popular thing to say, but the more one once I started to kinda of think more and more about the, the Greek references and how those might impact on the, the compilation overall. You know, Dirge of Cerberus is, is just jumping out. You know, not, not only does it have Cerberus, the, the, the sort of the 
the the hound that, that guarded the gates of the underworld, like in the title. Um, you know, a, anyone that's, that's played it is you'll know that there are quite obvious Greek references, like the, the, the names of the guns, like Hydra and Griffin, but when you start to peel back the layers um, of that, it it's it's almost like, um, uh, as, as we kind of spoke about in, uh, in previous conversations, or as we speke about in the books as well, like Kazuchi Gunajima himself, like the, the scenario writer for almost the entirety of the com- compilation, but not Dirge of Cerberus, he already had a background of sort of writing about Greek mythology in video games. And yes, it's yeah. like yeah, the Heracles. Yeah, yeah. and uh, when when Chiba wrote Dirge of Cerberus, it's almost like a love letter to Nojima's background. Uh, and the more I've looked at it, the more I've sort of began to extract information like, oh my God, this is, is, uh, is, is pretty remarkable, actually. Like, wow, um, that's interesting. You know, just sort of, I, I, I've been able to see a lot of parallels that I, I hadn't seen before. Um, one of the main ones is how, how much Vincent's story in Dirge of Cerberus does actually reflect the the labels of Heracles. Um, you know, in the relationship that Vincent has with Lucrezia, and abstractly Lucrezia's son, sort of quite. It marries up with Heracles getting himself into the situation where he has to go on these twelve labors because he uh, he needs to to repent for his sins um, because he, he kind of because of the death of his wife and his child and you know the the, the first thing that he comes up against is the the Nemean lion and he then wears the the furs of the the Nemean lion for the rest of the labors. And when you look at the the design of the Galian beast in Dirge of Cerberus versus what it's in in the original Final Fantasy VII, it's almost as if he's wearing he's wearing those furs, sort of thing. Wow! Um, wow, that's a fantastic reference. So we get to wow. you know, in, in other wee bits and pieces, and you look at the the, the sviets and. You know, uh, a large part of the story is uh, Vincent trying to get into deep ground, which towards towards the end of the labors is, is Heracles, or one of the most famous ones is Heracles actually making his way into the underworld uh, to borrow Cerberus. But Cerberus, of course, is the sort of the, the large the large beast that guards the gates, and the last uh, the last enemy you come up against before you actually enter the gates of deep ground is Arch Azul and, and that's Arch Azul, the behemoth. Um so there's there, there's kind of wee parallels that start to come out like that that I, um the more that I've I've been peeling back these layers, the more I'm realizing that like, yeah, there's a lot of very deliberate uh, Greek mythology references in Dirge of Cerberus specifically and it is like I said, it's it's almost as if it's a tribute to Nojima's past that, that Chima, uh, Chiba's stuck in there? Uh, uh, yes, a tribute or a, or a middle finger, one or the <laughs> other. <laughs> um, that's fascinating. Uh, and, you know, admittedly, I, I'm familiar enough with, with Greek mythology, uh, you know, on an academic level, but I have just never really uh you know gone through the effort of of being too comparative with with greek mythology um i've always assumed just based entirely on the title mm-hmm. that uh dirge of cerberus would have the the you know the the most obvi- obvious and transparent connections mm-hmm. uh to to greek mythology based entirely on the title like uh, you know, right off the bat, we've we've got something, um, but what about the rest of the compilation? Um, the okay, so I don't want to put you in a position of you know revealing things that are are so juicy yeah. that they're going to uh, you know de incentivize purchase of the of the of the book. But I am genuinely curious. Uh, was there any 
Is there any surprising reference specific to, say, remake that you've uncovered that you're you're willing to share at this at this minute? Um, the the remake one that I did pick out um does does tie in, I think, with the Honeybee Inn, and it's Ooh. it's such it's such a bizarre one. The, the, in order, in order to explain, I have to provide context because it's one of these ones that it works in parallel um, with something I've already spoken about um, uh, from the, the Norse mythology side of things, and that there's there's a story um, there's a story in the Norse mythology about uh, Thor, Thor um, losing his hammer yes. and having to dress up as a bride. Uh, to to go and, and reclaim it, so there's there's an awful lot of parallels between that story and Cloud uh, dressing up in order to to uh, get Tifa back because Don Corneo's looking for a bride. Um, but there's also the the story of how the gods came by Ambrosia. Uh, also relates to Zeus's wedding, so. In Norse mythology, there is no story that recounts Thor's wedding, There's, but there is one story where Thor is the bride. But in Greek mythology, there is a story about Zeus's wedding. Um, now, Norse mythology, the head of the pantheon was Odin, uh, but Odin was the, the, the sort of the uh, god of death and uh, a god of sort of magic and, and whatnot. He wasn't the traditional sky father that you would find in, in quite uh, or most of the, the Indo-European um, cultures um, so at, at some point right his his representation was far was uh, one of almost abstraction like he was it was difficult to define as the god of this the god of that exactly um, so so right so what you know many of the many of the, the sort of cultures had started their, their sort of mythologies with there was a sky father, there was an earth mother, and the sky father was one of the, the sort of more um, more important gods. You know, it's the same with mm-hmm. the sort of the, the Baltic or Slavic mythologies, and, and Perun is uh, a very good example of that from Slavic mythology. Yes. Um, but somewhere along the line, because um, the Vikings themselves were a warring uh, kind of culture and you know, revered death and particularly death of you know uh, the warriors. They transitioned from their their pre, or primary god being a uh, god of war, which was initially Tyr, and then transitioned to a, a god of death on the battlefield, who Odin is. Whereas other cultures, you know, more more sort of peaceful to an extent, uh, cultures, <laughs> uh, sort of continue to use the sky father, which is what Zeus was. Um and the kind of Thor Thor would would have been the sort of equivalent of the Sky Father in this, you know, he's the one that brings the thunder. He he's the one that brings the lightning. So the parallel right. here is between Thor and Zeus, and the story in Greek mythology of Zeus's wedding is that this is where honey is introduced. Um and it, you know there, there's a story about uh. The, the gods themselves are sort of filled with lust um, and uh, honey just sort of plays into this culture so it's it, it, the, the story itself is how the, the honeybee got its stinger but oh interesting it, it, effectively long story short is that when you take the connection between Thor and Zeus and then the stories between Thor dressing up as a bride and Zeus's wedding and combine the two it explains sort of where or why the honeybee in is this sort of certainly in the, the original game this this sort of place of what lust. Um, right. It's a you know, and Andrea Rodea, who's the proprietor, is you know, his name translates as Andrea of Rhodes sort of thing. Uh Rhodes being one of the Ro- Rhodesian, yeah. Um so you know there's there's still an awful lot that, that I, I kinda have to formulate. Uh, just I think going on this rambles a good <laughs> a, a good way of of showing just how poorly uh, I've I can articulate this. Um, 
so I, I need to get my thoughts down on paper and actually show the, exactly what the, the parallels were. But that's the one that jumped out for me um, in terms of you know what what has remake brought to, remake brought to the table that that wasn't um, apparent before. And the the story of the the how the gods got honey is is one of them. And I think that's where the honey be in. What the background to that is. And and you think that by extension perhaps. Rodea was as a reference to the Greek Isle of Rhodes. I think so. Possibly. I think so. And there's there's um, there's there's a, a very very loose connection as well. There, there were actually um, bee goddesses as well, um, and the, the they were they were connected to Rhodes, but very loosely. So I'm I'm still looking into okay. the, the connection there to see, um, but there's. There's snippets of information that, when put together, you can actually see. Oh, right, okay, this is there's actually quite a lot going on here, um, which I'm I'm really keen to to sort of get down. Um, but you know, uh, there's I, I've spent spent quite a lot of time looking at uh, like the original Final Fantasy VII as well, and some something that that you know. Remake has, has really reinforced, and we knew this anyway from across the compilation, but something that's definitely reinforced with uh, Remake is the connection between Aerith and water and communicating through water. And, you know, it's becoming more and more apparent that there is a connection between the ancients in general and water. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not just the that's the mythos of Final Fantasy VII. There's actually kind of wider connections uh, that, that are being made, like uh, like in the Temple of the Ancients, for example. Uh, you Or Sid gets the weapon Trident, which is was also the weapon of Poseidon, who is the god of the seas in Greek mythology. So there, there, are, there are quite specific connections between water and ancients. That are not obvious. Yeah, that's a concrete connection for sure. But you, you yeah. kind of have to know the background to, like, where this trident connect the dots. Yeah, to, to sort of make yeah. make the make that connection to to bring it all together. So, um, yeah, it's there's 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 a huge a huge amount going on that, uh, because we're we're in the early stages of like a lot of the research has been done, but it's more about now kind of structuring the chapters. And making sure that the ideas that make sense and should be in the book are are uh, sort of formulated correctly. And at, at the moment, because I've not quite got to that stage, uh, I feel as if I'm just word vomiting a little bit. Um, uh, it, I, I, I I'm eating up that delicious word vomit. <laughs> uh, every, every syllable of it. I so I have a question. Just you know. Directing the conversation towards what I think everybody is conversing about yeah. these days, uh, with with the, in regards to remake, mm -hmm. uh, it, it used mystery box storytelling style. So we have this big, this big confusing mess of lore that's generated a, a bunch of uh, you know theories about where the where the thing's going. Uh, there are differences in remake, particularly that have uh added layers of complication yeah. to certain characters yeah. um including the ability to uh you know see the future mm -hmm. and be participating in the future and uh and it's sort of i think at least in my mind and and uh and i could see elements of this in Norse myths that inspired final mm -hmm. fantasy 7 uh Aerith is one of the recipients of of this of this categorization that seems to to really have tremendous parallels yeah. in a variety of of myths, religions, and thought systems. Uh, you know that it's one of the most pervasive pervasive myths mm -hmm. in all of comparative mythology. You know the Seeress, yeah. the 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 you know, and in Greek mythology. I I can only imagine there, that you found or started to explore some connection. Uh, 
are you at liberty to talk about that at all? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Uh, there, there are there are two sort of key things that uh, I've I've discovered with Edith, and I, I I did sort of speak about 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 them uh, in the Norse myths book, and you know mm-hmm. without sort of dancing around the subject, that is uh, is to do with the the fates, and you know a lot a lot of mm. remakes. Um, you know, a lot of the changes are to do with with the whispers or the arbiters of fate, and you know, Aerith, uh having the ability to to sort of understand more than than she previously could uh, elsewhere in the compilation. Um, so digging into that and and looking at how that connected to the the norns of Norse mythology and the the norns themselves, or at least the three main norns, were responsible for. You know the the fates of individuals, you know, and the the specific destinies, and obviously remake itself, particularly towards the end of the game, has this large overarching theme of of destiny and trying to break destiny. Um, one of the the things I I suspect that, and you know, myself and you and in, in, in Sleep Easy, uh, I think had this discussion uh, uh, way back where, it, you know. With the norns, there's there's some information, but not a huge amount of information. Uh, in Greek mythology, there's actually far more information given about the fates, or they're, they're called the moirai, and how they um, how they create the the threads of fate, and each thread represents an individual, and it can be cut at the end of their life, and it's all woven together in this sort of grand scheme. And you know, we we know, and we we have known to some extent. Um, that an individual's existence uh, relates to spirit energy, and spirit energy as part of the life stream can be seen as mm-hmm. a strand or a few strands. So this idea that someone's fate, you know, uh, or their existence, their experiences, their memories are all connected to strands, and then introduce this idea of of fates or moirai um, from from Greek mythology via the whispers. You know, the whole thing starts. Uh, to to become entwined and um I I think it's I think it's really cool to 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 go a bit deeper than I did in the, the Norse mythology book simply because um there is there's more information to play around with Abs- um, absolutely the I mean with with Norse mythology we were largely reliant on um on just the Eddas mm-hmm. which. I'm grateful for, but they are a little sparse, uh, along with spoken word. Mm-hmm. And when spoken word, uh, you know, has this, has this, uh, real difficulty in, in, in catching cohesion. But with, with Greek mythology, the amount of, of preserved documentation we have, um, on these stories and these stories are all extremely cohesive mm-hmm. and replicated and it's 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 a huge wealth. Yeah. Uh, so for a character like the Morai, the Morai have uh, you know, uh, there's compendium that you can you know find at a at a local academic or place of academic study, specifically relating to the Morai. Yeah. And um, you can't say that with with Greek mythology. It's, you know, and the I'm I'm sure it's the German uh, version of remake that actually calls the whispers the Moirai. So it's not it's not even hiding the fact that there's a connection there. Um, you know, it's, I I think uh, I, the 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 German translation of remake uh, has a lot of juicy stuff. Yeah. Uh, that is definitely one of them, and most of that juicy stuff. Is surrounding the arbiters, the whispers, mm-hmm. uh, and um, and the specters, the enigmatic yeah. specters. Um, so that's that's quite the find. Uh, and I'm I'll I'll be honest, I'm a little jealous <laughs> that you you caught it before I did. Um, so it's there's there's, there's so much, and there's there's another thing about Aerith, which this is, I mean, in hindsight, I guess it. It, it should be obvious, but it never was obvious. Um, but I, I think there are there are two 
Aerith, when we think about her as a character and, and what she brings to Final Fantasy VII's story, there are two main, um, not necessarily themes, but uh, maybe maybe s- things that she symbolises. Um, and both both of these things that Aerith symbolises are symbolised by a goddess in Greek mythology as well. Uh, really quite specifically uh i don't really want to say more on it just now um okay which that's i i respect that uh, I respect because that. it's is one of these ones where um once i started looking into it and, and finding the parallels and putting it together i got really quite excited so i'll need to save this one for for uh another day uh but there's uh look, looking into this and it was the same with the norse mythology book that uh the, the more i researched the more you know, I uncovered and the things that surprised me as well, you know, that I, I never expected to be writing about. Um so I think I think Aerith as a character and her connections to, to Greek mythology uh, are going to have a chapter dedicated uh, to it. There's there's so much and it's 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 really interesting. So uh please be excited, I guess. <laughs> I I am. I am and I you know, I know how, how much uh, work it is to categorize all this too, because uh, you you are now looking at this from a fresh perspective. Mm-hmm. You're relearning a lot of things that you may have, you know, uh, you may have somewhere in your brain, but uh, you would never expect it to 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 make a categorical uh, link yeah. between you know your favorite video game and this information. And so I, I imagine it's it's uh, it's quite the journey. Uh, is it a journey that you you deeply enjoy? Yes, very much so. Um, it, it has I must admit it has been challenging to, you know, the the best way I can really describe it is is like switching a lens. So looking at the compilation, mm. looking at Final Fantasy VII story with a completely different filter. Um, and there are things that that sort of leap out that are perhaps obvious. Um. I I tend, you know, my my method is uh, to to sort of go out for for walks once a day and listen to uh, audio books, um, retelling Greek myths and mm. uh, taking notes uh, just on my phone as I'm doing it. And the number of times that I actually have to stop in my tracks because an idea has just presented itself, um, you know what. You know, five or six times per walk, this will happen, and it's <laughs> um, you know, there's there's a huge, huge amount. Um, uh, I'm I'm still I'm still going uh, just now, but I've, I've sort of crossed the forty pages of notes. Um, wow! Work just now, so there's uh, the category categorization process has has well and truly started, but yeah, there's there's a lot of information, so it's it's really about. The next stage is identifying what works, what doesn't work. Um, how can I best structure this in a chapter, uh, and sort of moving forward from there. Uh, is there is there anything like obviously we've spoken about things that have jumped out at me? Is there anything in particular that you are interested in in having explored uh, as as part of this? Well, a, a, a few things. Um, I have a I have a favorite like pet topic Mm -hmm. in in final fantasy 7 and that's that's minerva yeah and i know that minerva isn't uh doesn't have a a direct uh connection to greece Mm -hmm. but um you know etruscan and roman mythology were you know intensely derivative of of greek mythology and um and given how how easily and willing uh, Nojima in particular has been to, you know, sort of role switch with, with each of these, you know, characters or concepts in mythologies, uh, you know, comparative uh, brothers and sisters, you know, or, or, uh, or, or comparative paradigms and thought, yeah. um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of quote unquote fast switching between um 
say gnostic concepts of of the the demiurge and the monad with with what ein sof is and then and then by extension what jehovah is mm -hmm. and what by extension jenova is and so a lot of those uh you know parallel concepts will will come out in different ways and so given that with a character as as sort of mysterious and interesting and as as Minerva who to me is was I, I think the best lore edition of uh Crisis Core which uh is either you know a a massive compliment to Minerva's inclusion mm -hmm. or um a huge dig on Crisis Core the the there's this real mystery to her representation as the voice of the planet or will of the planet mm -hmm. and um recent recent uh recent retranslations that w that uh sleep easy and i have looked at have have made that even less uh clear mm -hmm. and uh you know let let uh, more ambiguous uh so i i really like that as a pet topic so i, I have a feeling that uh minerva is going to um get a mention in your in your book oh yes uh, even though it is oh, yes. it is not necessarily uh, a greek myth uh and then the other one is um is the planet uh gaia and uh you you touched on gaia's cliff mm -hmm. and uh just the concept of gaia in general you know i mean there's no it, to my knowledge uh to my knowledge the the canonicity of what the planet's name even is is still debated you know like is it actually gaia yeah. you know and and um i'm not here to actually argue that with you but uh the 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 planet is an absolute absolutely a character yeah. of final fantasy 7's lore and it's a character that you don't necessarily know or even consider to be a character it's not it's not necessarily personified in a in an upfront way a lot of a, a lot of what we understand of the planet's agency does unfortunately come from you know deep deep dives yeah. and uh and and sort of a esoteric look at the whole of the of the compilation but it's super fascinating to me as somebody that eats this stuff up yeah. like it's candy so i'm really excited to see what uh what you find in in those two particular greek focuses well, I, I, can, um, I can definitely definitely confirm uh there's there's quite a lot of content uh that i've i've been able to dig out um i'll just i'll give you a couple of tidbits um one is Ooh. that um, after humanity is created by Zeus uh, in Greek mythology, uh, Gaia doesn't really have. Um, she doesn't really want much to do with them, um, with the exception of one story where she helps repopulate. Um, but there's there's quite definitive parallels between Gaia and Greek mythology's indifference uh, towards humanity and uh, the planet. The, the big question, of course, coming out of Remake is, is is the planet on the side of humanity or is it actually in the planet's best interest that humanity ceases to exist? Um, Minerva, there's... there's uh, for anyone who's who's not massively familiar with this, um, Minerva, the closest Greek equivalent to the Roman goddess Minerva is Athena. Um, mm -hmm. Although there are some differences... Um, in terms of what they specifically represented, um, the one of my my favorite um, that there's quite an abstract one um, where when Athena was born um, from Zeus's head, um, there there were emerald snakes. Very specifically, states emerald snakes come out of the sea. Um, so I wonder if that's a connection to the emerald weapon hiding in the caves of Benora. Interesting. Um, but going back to Minerva being the will of the planet or being the voice of the planet, um, Athena in Greek mythology um, was Zeus's favourite daughter and could actually change Zeus's mind 
but not to the same extent as Athena's mother, Metis. And the story is that um, when Zeus tried to have his wicked way with Metis, um, she turned into a fly to escape him and he, he ate her. But she did it deliberately so that she could actually remain in his brain and be his voice of conscience. So we've got a situation where Athena's mother, Metis, is the voice of conscience of the sort of all-powerful god. So we might end up, like, there's a, a, an argument, there's a parallel there, is that Minerva being the voice of the planet mirrors Athena's mother, Metis, being the voice of god. That is, that's fascinating. Um, and, you know, the Minerva's one of a, of a trio, too, and and trios certainly uh, are are not are not sparse mm-hmm. in the compilation, yeah. um, and the the two other members of the 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 Cap, the Capitoline triad triad, which is like uh, Jupiter and Juno, mm-hmm. Jupiter and Juno both have uh, you know quite the uh, Quite the prestigious parallels in Greek Minerva to, in in Greek uh, Greek mythology too, which I'm sure uh, is just a a well of interesting yeah. stuff. It's uh, it's it's endlessly fascinating, and uh, I I do anticipate that Minerva is going to show up quite heavily um, over the course of at least one chapter. Uh, for for some of the reasons I've already given. Uh, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Um. So I would say those those are uh things I'm I'm really interested in and and the the last thing I'm interested in I is um it, it's actually just how this how Greek mythology is is overall structured into the the this history that we're getting of 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 the world mm-hmm. That Final Fantasy VII takes place in, and and we'll call it Gaia for now. And uh, you know, recently Nojima has has written this book, Traces of Two Past, which has uh, given us like just this little glimpse of ultra interesting uh, context yeah. as to the history of religion in in the world mm-hmm. of of Gaia. We we now have this Republic of Junon. Yeah. Uh, speaking of you know Etruscan figures, uh, Junon is derivative of Juno, yeah. and the the Republican of Junon was apparently a monotheistic religion mm-hmm. that fell sometime within you know as as recent as thirty years of the events of of, of Final Fantasy VII. There is there you could make an argument that it it fell after the uh, after Midgar was started its its development started its construction um and so this 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 sort of obviously you know one of the things that uh that final fantasy 7 is known for is is drawing parallels with geopolitical structures yeah. and 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 political systems and um and how religion plays into that is, you know, it's inescapable. You can't avoid the the relationship. And so we've got this representation of the Republic of Junon, mm-hmm. which has this monotheistic theistic belief that includes an afterlife, yeah, uh, and includes a heaven and hell. Um, that's been sort of replaced by Shinra, which is corporate and teaches that there, you know, this is the only life we have. And, you know, there's obvious parallels there with, you know, sort of the militant, uh, uh, militant faithlessness, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I don't have an actual opinion on that, but that is, that is now being presented as this connection. Yeah. And then, and then we've got the religion of the ancients, which came quote unquote, long long before that and um so i i really want to see um you know if you find anything of of value or interest in uh these new enhanced depictions of the of the overall lore and where i see those coming from are the traces of two paths uh the the novel by nojima and the first soldier, which uh, at the time of this recording is right around the corner, mm-hmm. so I, 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 I hope that we get to see uh, 
you know, see elements of those in your in your new novel. Yeah, I, I, I'll be keeping a very close eye um, because the, mm-hmm. the the new book is not expected out until the second half of twenty twenty two. So, you know, uh, there's there's plenty of time for us to sort of pick apart. Uh, the first soldier and yeah, we might we we might even have elements of ever crisis by then maybe. um and it's yeah. i mean that's that's sort of the beauty of this is that final fantasy 7 is not going away anytime soon so i'm sure that there's just more and more and more that that we'll be able to to sort of extrapolate as, as the years go on and i'm enormously excited about it likewise indeed um so i mean you you mentioned a release window and the release window, uh, uh, you know, it it reminds me of of uh, how this process started and how it it really came together. And uh, I can't think of of anything else more, uh, you know, indi- indicating of that than than the Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, you know, first of all, congratulations on the success. Thank you. Uh, Thank I you. was, I, I. You know, I happen to be live on stream <laughs> when uh, when that that launched. I had Sleep Easy with me, and we just basically watched for ten minutes as uh, as your Kickstarter, you know, hit its goal, and it was it was incredible. What? Um, uh, tell me about what you know. Why do you, why did you do why did you start a, a Kickstarter and? Um, uh, what are your plans with your Kickstarter? Um, well, the the reason the reason that I really sort of went for it was that when back when I was writing Norse myths that inspired Final Fantasy VII, like I had no idea at all how this was going to be received. You know, I had no idea if there was a market for it. I had no idea, you know, if if there was maybe ten people would pick up a copy of the book and hate it. You know, um. But having having had that book be quite successful, um, I I felt that it would be a good way of okay. Let let's see what we can do to, to expand on this. Um, you know that I was really lucky that you know a friend of mine, Kelly Henderson, provided that the artwork uh, for for Norse Myths that inspired Final Fantasy Seven. But we never really did anything with using that artwork for prints or, or for postcards or as as individual items um and i felt you know there's the because of the nature of the book because of the artwork that would come with it because of all the other bits and pieces that i've done over the years that i've I've sort of gained experience on why not put that into a way that i can share that with everyone all up front in a way that i've never really done before um and you know obviously it would be remiss of me not to you know, touch on that there's there's always going to be the financial element of as well but a lot of it was of course. To, to be able to kind of I guess just be able to gauge up front how the book might be received or whether or not this was something you know what 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 did people want me to you know what what direction would they like me to take for the book what what sort of thing would they like included you know do they want a short and concise book do they want kind of long and quite um, explorative book. Um, so it, g- it gave me this opportunity in advance to, to be able to engage with uh, the audience a lot more, um, which is what I, I really liked about it. And, you know, I've been so, so privileged that uh, a very good friend of mine, AJ Haley, who uh, owns owns the sort of video game brand, or merchandise brand, Game Tea Limited, uh, she's run about a dozen of these Kickstarter campaigns before, so she, she sort of held my hand the whole way of the do's and don'ts and what's what's good practice, what what would work. So I'm enormously grateful to, to AJ and it wouldn't have been, you know, half of uh what it, it looked like in the end if it wasn't for AJ. Um the same with uh Kale Leon or Lyons, sorry. Um, you know, the Kale's someone who I've been desperate to work with for a couple of years. Um and he's he's provided some phenomenal artwork. Um, I wanted to show you the the secret artwork. I don't I don't think you've seen it yet, have you? Uh, I have not. The, the secret artwork that he did. Um, this this was for day one backers. Um, uh, for for anyone who, who sort of pledged 
um, within the first 24 hours uh, would get access to this. So it's uh, everyone else I'll, I'll share with when the, the actual book itself launches. Um, but it's I gave him a brief of uh, something that I would like to see but go away and be creative about it. And what he came back with was just sensational. So uh, I the, the feedback that I've had from the, the, the day one backers has been pretty pretty great. Uh, so I'm I'm delighted I'm delighted about that and I'm just massively grateful I guess um, that you know so many people have, have sort of pledged their their sort of hard earned dollars to uh, to allow me to go ahead and, and create something that I'm very passionate about and you know I hope that the, the product itself will be of the same ilk uh, as Norse Myths inspired Final Fantasy Seven. Because the the reception for that has has been pretty pretty humbling as well, um. So it's you know I've I've big plans for the future, and some some of them I've kind of spoken about uh, previously in public, and some of them I haven't. So I've I big ideas about the direction I would like for my writing career to take. So this is this is kind of phase two, uh, of of where where that's going. Uh, and you know if if this continues to be successful, then you know who knows where it might take us. Uh, so who, who knows indeed? So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm pretty excited about being able to to share all this uh, with uh, with the backers and and sort of later with with the sort of general public. You know, it's again it's it's something I'm wildly passionate about and. You know, I'm, I've I've been blown away by the support I've received. So so thank you to everyone who who did back uh, the project, and, and you know I hope I hope I can deliver exactly what you're looking for. I I have I have nothing but faith that you will. I I cannot I cannot emphasize enough how how valuable the the art affiliated with your projects uh is it is it is just truly unique it really um it's it's something that i look forward to as much as as uh as people's responses to uh the content of uh, that you've written mm-hmm. is is the art that you include and so um i i have seen some of what uh of what some of of what's you know planned to be yeah. in in Greek myths, and all of it has just been uh, you know next level, and so I'm I'm I cannot stress enough how uh, how much your uh, insistence that that good original artists um, uh, you know contribute to this project. Uh, you know, is for the overall quality and feeling of quality that that people that support you and support this, um, you know, are 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 the recipients of, and I, I think that's just wonderful. Um, regarding how things are going, mm-hmm. you know, what is your current status? I mean, you gave me a little bit of a clue that you're. Uh, you know, you've got kind of a, a release window, and you've got uh, you know some forty pages of notes, etc. But uh, I know there's some goals that that you uh, set on on Kickstarter, and I and how are you doing on those? Um, well, the, with regards to the book itself, um, I've I've made made good headway on this. Um, a lot of a lot of the research uh, has been completed. Um, everything I wanted to research in terms of the the sort of gods. And the the creation of the the gods myth cycle, uh, that's that's all been done. So I'm focusing more on the moment, uh, the the sort of heroes, say the things like Heracles or Theseus or uh, Perseus, um, or the Trojan War, things like that. So the the epics. Mm-hmm. Um, so some some of what's coming out of uh, the the heroes say the things is really interesting as well, uh, particularly because that's um, when Najima. Uh, worked previously on the Glory of Heracles series, uh, like the Trojan War was the setting for one of the games, um, the Battle of Thermopylae, which is the the sort of Spartan battle that, that occurs in the the movie Three Hundred. Uh, Three Hundred, so that yeah. That's another one of the 
uh, the settings for his game. So being able to look into that side of things has, has been uh, pretty interesting. Um, and at, at the moment, you know, there's there's a couple of uh, chapters that I've, I've kind of started on, uh, but for the most part, it's actually getting that structure in place, and it's it's quite for anyone who's who hasn't prepared the book in advance. It's it's not really a case of just starting at the beginning and hoping for the best. You know, you, you do have to to sort of understand what is the best way to to tell this story because there there has to be some form of story. You know, the the myth cycle doesn't start in the middle. You know, you have to sort of present the settings of this is how the universe was created. Here are the main players. And then go into some of the tales so that you already have the context of, you know, what's going on in the tales. And um, so being able to, to bring that information together, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy this side of things, but it does take a lot of time and a lot of sort of forward planning. Um, so that's where we are just now on most of the chapters, just getting those structures in place. Uh, in terms of uh, the rewards for the Kickstarters, um, Kickstarter or backers uh, should recently have received uh, messages through Kickstarter uh, from myself where one of one of the things that all backers um, uh, are due to receive was a kind of PDF of the the special edition of Norse Myths that inspired Final Fantasy VII, which actually has an extra forty pages in it of sort of like unused or early content um, and some artwork as well from Kelly Henderson that, that didn't make the final cut. Um, so it's 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 the complete edition. But yeah, it's basically it's the complete edition in PDF format mm-hmm. uh, for everyone. And there's also a PDF that, that has all the, the concept artwork that Kale Lyons uh, has prepared for us uh, for Greek myths that's inspired Final Fantasy VII. Um, and for those who backed the, the project on the first day, there's also the secret artwork in there as well. Uh, so that's uh, that's that's a special special little thing for them, because um, that's that's exclusive as you can get. No one else has actually seen that at all. Um, the next thing that's coming is, as I'm sure I've, I've kind of touched on a hundred times on social media. Um, I'm also having a, an audiobook completed for the the Norse Myths book um, that's being read by Liam Mulvey, who plays Libertus. In the Final Fantasy Seven, uh, Final Fantasy Seven, Final Fantasy Fifteen universe, uh, Liam and I are good friends, mm-hmm. um, and you know I'm, he's he's done an amazing job. So we're we're actually just doing the final checks as we speak, um, and that's due out in the next couple of weeks. Um, so just because it was a, a stretch goal within uh, the Kickstarter campaign itself, uh, all backers will actually receive a complimentary copy of that. Uh, so if you do enjoy the book or you're not too familiar with the book, it's, it is coming to you uh, in audiobook form. Um, and I'm hoping to get some of the, for the, again, for, for day one backers, uh, I promised personalised video messages. Um, so those those will be coming out uh, as soon as possible, but the logistics of them of sort of recording, uploading, putting them on a, a file sharing um, site, for each individual, it, it takes a bit of time. So, uh, apologies for anyone that's waiting on that. I, I am, I am working on it, uh, and all the, the the physical stuff has all been ordered. Uh, so that should be, that should be making its way to backers, probably by the end of November. That'll be getting shipped. That that is that is fantastic. I do want the listener to know that. I did offer my services as the narrator <laughs> and uh and and MJ decided that uh he would prefer uh the voice of Liam Mulvey. Um so if you're listening to this voice and you find it just incredibly soothing in comparison, um I I suggest a, a strongly worded letter. <laughs> Uh, to MJ, uh, requesting a remake of his yeah, audio book. We'll, um, we'll get a petition going for you to do the Greek myths one. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, uh, that'll be my consolation prize. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I think I think it's probably a good. It's a good place to wrap up. Um, so uh, again, uh, thank you so much, Baby Seal, for for being 
uh, for being on the, the show with me. I, I massively appreciate your time. Um, and thank you, thank you so much again to to Kickstarter backers. This this podcast will be available uh, for everyone to listen to, but uh, I would like to take the opportunity to just once again to see how much I value uh, your support and, and everything you've done in getting this project off the ground. Uh, so so thank you, and uh, yeah, take care. Bye, guys, and thank you, Mo, for everything that you do for the Final Fantasy VII community. Uh, I know a lot of it is selfless and a lot of it is uh, a labor of love. Uh, I, I, Even though you benefit from it, um, I think I've seen you put uh, much more into this than uh, you've received. And uh, we're all very grateful for everything that you do. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, uh, take care, everyone. I'll speak to you again soon.